If you love what you hear, check out our authors Andrea Stewart and N.A. Fulton on Amazon.com, and be sure to subscribe to our Dark Romance Novels and Stories podcast on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast provider. Learn more about us at audioiron.com. Pirate's Desire by Andrea Stewart. Chapter 3 Lord Henry Norfolk, irritated at the pace with which the matter proceeded, sat in his uncle's study. It had been almost four weeks, and still Black was a free man. He had even seen the rogue at the gaming tables the night just passed, apparently untroubled by his precarious position in society. Norfolk had hired spies to watch him, was paying men to solve the riddle of his mysterious reappearance, and had offered bribes to two of the peers who were all that stood between Black and a prison cell. And all for naught. The man still remained at liberty. Feet resting upon his uncle's desk, Henry waited for the frail old man to finish the missive he was penning for the Spanish emissary as if he had all the time in the world to waste. How could his uncle, a man of considerable means, devote himself so completely to the Queen's business? What satisfaction could he find in a practice that resulted in no personal gain and tied up all his time? It was the very definition of self-sacrifice. Eventually Lord Pembroke set aside his correspondence and began addressing his nephew's demands. The matter is being investigated most carefully my boy. The Crown has little doubt Lord Black is guilty of his uncle's murder, but a trial requires two witnesses and at the moment we have none. Norfolk could not believe his ears. You are waiting for others to confess to a murder Lord Black committed. What sense is there in that? Arrest him and press him for the truth. Do you not have ways of encouraging a man to confess? Henry dropped his feet to the floor and stood up. While you delay, a young girl is being despoiled by the blackguard. Whatever else Lord Black may be, he is the Earl of Kettering. We can hardly put a peer of the realm to the rack. And as there were no witnesses to the old Earl's death in his study, and as he was a man with far too many enemies to count, we need two of the Confederates who have provided Black with an alibi to recant. And what is it to you if he is having away with some trollop? Surely you have no interest in her. Neither your mother or the Queen will allow you to have her to wife, said Pembroke. Henry shook his head. It's nothing like that uncle. She is an entirely innocent creature. I seek only to protect her. The girl has a brother. If she is being interfered with, let him settle the matter. I forbid you to call the Earl out. We both know your mother would die of a broken heart if anything happened to you. You are her only child Henry, and you have put her through far too much already. I am all too aware of mother's concern. She faints when I wager on a horse race. But you cannot stand by while the bastard has his way with her. Patience. In time the matter will be resolved to your satisfaction. Till then simply steer clear of the Earl and the waif he has taken up with. Said Pembroke. But you cannot leave him at liberty when we know he is guilty. Lord Pembroke shook his head and was silent for a moment. In recent years I had often doubted your character and yet here you are defending some country made as though your very life depended upon it. It is good to see you have acquired a conscience my boy. It was a very long time in coming. Norfolk made no response. How could a man in his uncle's position be so blind? The old man leaned forward to point an old finger at Henry. But you mark me. Stay well away from Devon Black. You may be a match for men about town, but this new earl is of an entirely different breed. You are not to call him out. I will take it much amiss if you involve yourself in this matter in any way. Of course I won't invite him to the green. I will not treat a rogue as a gentleman when he is clearly anything but. Since you command me to wait, and assure me justice will be done, I will master my impatience. As always, Henry lied to his uncle easily and without regret. Since the Crown wouldn't arrange a speedy execution for the brute, Henry would simply take matters into his own hands and find another way to kill him. This was London and there were any number of ways a new earl could die.
Lord Norfolk watched Devon Black emerge from his coach and step into the rain that poured from the midnight sky like water through a sieve. As Norfolk's spy had predicted, the man had arrived at the stroke of midnight. He was dressed in rough dark clothes, like a common tradesman, and he appeared unarmed. Norfolk watched as he paused to say something to his driver and then waved the coach on its way. The Earl boarded one of the dark ships that lurched and bobbed in the swirling river. He spoke to a crewman who was standing guard. A moment later the man went below, returning a short time later with a taller fellow. Together Black and the tall man left the ship, heading into one of the alehouses alongside the wharf from which light and music poured. Henry and his pair of burly associates left the relative comfort of his hired carriage and walked down the cobbled street to enter the same establishment. They moved through the crowd of lecherous drunks and dirty serving women to sit at a rough-hewn bench in the back corner of the taproom. Norfolk turned so he could watch Black talk to the tall man, wondering what on earth such an unequal pair had to discuss. That's the one then? said one of the thugs beside him. Course it's him. Don't be stupid. said the other. He was slightly smaller but somewhat older than his companion. Norfolk spoke to the oversized pair without turning his head. Can you take him? And him being naught than a pawn sea lord? You'll be having us on. Scoffed the larger man. Then, with a glance at Norfolk, he belatedly added. Begging your pardon sir. The other man was sizing Black up carefully. Eventually he said. Man looks a menace true enough. He didn't come by the marm sipping tea. But he'll be no match for me and Merrick. A barmaid came by to offer drinks. She gave Norfolk a long slow look and gave him a good view of her breasts as she dipped to take his order. I warrant the lady fancies you, my lord. Said Jake as the girl moved away. He gave Norfolk a snaggle-toothed smile. I want you to kill him. Said Norfolk. Follow him from the pub and slit his throat when you have him alone. A hundred pounds when the deed is done. Easy money for an hour's work. Jake studied Norfolk for a moment, then nodded. We have a bargain, my lord. Norfolk rose from the table. He dropped a pair of silver coins before them to pay for the drinks. Thank you, gentlemen. I look forward to hearing of our friend's untimely demise. I'll see you here tomorrow night to hand over your reward. Norfolk left without waiting for either man to reply. Black knew he was being followed from the moment he left the taproom. The pair of oafs had made no attempt to hide their hurry as he rose from his seat and walked to the door. Two big farm boys come to make a life for themselves in the city he supposed. Ham-fisted, broad-shouldered, muscle-bound, tall. Ruffians for hire no doubt and likely new to the city to boot. He felt his blood sing as he led them away from the pub and his ship. He turned down a silent street between a pair of warehouses. London seemed full of enemies these days, but these two were the first to present themselves in such a forthright fashion. He found himself wanting to thank them for giving him such a pleasant way to express his fury. They called out to him as he made a right turn into a dead-end alley. He knew this little cul-de-sac well because he owned the three warehouses that defined it. They were stuffed to the gills with French brandy, Spanish oranges, Italian fabrics, and Indian spices, along with chocolate, rum, and tobacco. In a few days the belly of his boat would be headed to the colonies where some of this bounty would start to reward his crew for all their years of service. The rest of the goods in the warehouse would be sold across London. It was so easy for him to trade at a profit as an English peer. Reaching the end of the alley, he pretended to fumble with a locked door. He heard the men laugh as they approached. Clearly they thought him frightened. The truth was he had lured them here to die. When they were close enough, he turned. Can I help you gentlemen? Me and Jake were wondering if you had some coin you'd like to share with us your lordship. Black smiled, turned to the smaller of the men. Is that what you were wondering Jake? Shut your trap Merrick. There's no call to be telling him our names. As he spoke, the man called Jake was coming around on Black's right. He held something in his hands, an iron club of some kind. Black saw the one called Merrick held a dagger that caught the moonlight. You two wouldn't be brothers, would you? Black slid his hand down his thigh, found the haft of his knife. The last time I killed a pair like you, they were brothers. Listen to him talk. Merrick scoffed as he stepped forward. Black saw the man's blade sweep toward his chest and he took a step back. He dropped down to one knee and drove his knife into the man's side. 
With years of long practice he curled his blade up along a rib and drove it up into the man's heart. Merrick dropped like a stone. Merrick? Jake had raised the club over his head. His night vision must have been weak, because he did not seem to understand that his brother was already bleeding to death at his feet. Black grabbed the club and jerked on it hard, as if trying to wrench it out of the man's hands. Jake held on and was dragged forward into Black's knife. Black jerked the blade out then drew it across the man's throat. He dropped Jake atop his fellow assassin while he was still striving to staunch the blood from his slashed jugular. Barely winded, Black looked around to ensure that he had not missed any other assailants. At the end of the alley he saw that a carriage was stopped. Its windows were dark, the driver a statue. Inside he could make out the shape of a man. He started toward the carriage just as it jerked into motion. Norfolk evaluated the results of his attack on Lord Black dispassionately. The man was obviously competent at defending himself. Of course, garden variety thugs were hardly a match for a well-trained man, but it was rather surprising that Black had dispatched these two in just a few seconds. His uncle was right. The Earl of Kettering was a killer. That said, Norfolk had no doubt that he could best the brute in a duel. He had decades of daily training under his belt, and had put more than a dozen in the ground. Lord Black was obviously a street fighter. He preferred to settle his affairs in dark alleys and in the dead of night with a short blade. Make him fight with a rapier in a cold dawn and he would fall as so many better men had before him. But a duel seemed out of the question. While his uncle lived, Norfolk could not go against him in the important things. It was tantamount to going against the Queen herself. Furthermore, Lord Pembroke was an elderly man with a vast personal estate. Henry was due to inherit much on the old man's death, including yet another title. There was no use jeopardizing all that over a cur like Black. On the other hand, it would be so nice to kill the arrogant bastard himself, preferably with the girl watching. He could imagine it so clearly. Black would bleed to death, she would hold his head as he gasped his last. And later Norfolk would take her brutally, as he described all he had done to have her. Sooner or later, Norfolk knew, he would find a way to bring his desired ends about. He was nothing if not a master of murderous machination. Pirate's Desire by Andrea Stewart, voice recording copyright 2019 by Nancy Fulton, music by Alexander Shavarev licensed from Pond 5.